September 11, 1883, Margaret Lippincott visited and showed me her poems, and I began to write poetry again. February 1885, my first poem published by Godey's. Dansky published 38 of her poems in 1888 in her first volume called Joy and Other Poems, to much acclaim. 38 more became her book Rose Break Poems. Just two years later, and one of its poems, The Struggle, was spotted by the foremost poet John Greenleaf Whittier for inclusion in his volume of favorite poems called Songs of Three Centuries. To fully enjoy a summer out of doors, one should not take a daily newspaper. We are put here for such a little while. Why should we hate and vex and trouble one another? How much better it is to raise wheat and cabbages peacefully than to go and lay waste other people's grain fields and cabbage patches. When I go out to the hammock in the leisurely afternoon, I debate within myself what spirit shall be my companion. Books are mediums, and by them we live in communion with the spirits of the absent or the departed. For the garden, I want very choice company. Jeffers, Thoreau, Burroughs, and among poets, Chaucer, Spencer, Wordsworth are favorite guests. My test for a book in the summer is, will it do to read under the trees? Almost all good poetry is adapted to out-of-door reading. All that rings false or hollow, all novels of fashionable life or ignoble ambition are as out of place in the grave and reverent company of trees as a painted and bedizened woman of the world would be. History cannot peacefully be read in the hammock because it is too harrowing. The grove is no fit arena for marchings and countermarchings, massacres and bloody victories. I choose my companions very carefully for this, my hour or two of peace, after the work of the day is over. I do not want any book that would jar the quiet harmony of sky and cloud and treetops or disturb the brooding calm of the hills. Pure, not too strenuous love stories gain a fresh charm read in this manner, and so do fairy stories and romances, for which I still have a weakness. Hmm, I think I will have to complete my shelf with children's books, such as Hans Christian Andersen and Hawthorne's Wonder Book and Mrs. Ewing's stories, at least the most cheerful of them. After all, we have to go to the children's bookcases for cheerfulness nowadays. It has not yet become the fashion to write pessimistic literature for them, thank heaven. Ugh, when children's books become morbid, I will no longer have any hope for the human race. Lillian Whiting says that it is everyone's duty to be happy. The young ladies scour the country in search of amusement, going 10 miles to a dance and coming home to lie in bed all the morning. I stay quietly in my hammock, and not amusement, but better far, her sister, enjoyment, comes to me unsolicited. She floats on the swan-white clouds, glows in the sunsets, rises in the pages of books. She closes my eyes at night, wakes up with me in the morning, and her other name is Content. Although its residents abuse Shepherdstown very much and are frequently heard to wish passionately that they lived anywhere else, yet it exercises a curious fascination over all who have once found it out to come back to it again and again. But I call Shepherdstown gruesome because it keeps up the old custom of tolling the church bell for a funeral. 
the biggest thing belonging to Doddletown, or Shepherdstown, is its graveyard, which lies on the turnpike between Rosebreak and the village. The farmer folk for many miles around lay their dead in this old graveyard, and death so common that one or other of the seven church spires announces a new one nearly every day. You pause involuntarily in whatever you may be doing to count the strokes. Oh, what with the rows of tombstones in full view from my hammock, and with all this tolling, I'm in no danger of forgetting my latter end. This custom of Shepherdstown does not tend to promote hilarity in its inhabitants. Ah, oh, me. My thoughts go back to the time when there was a little boy here to fill the lonely old house with joy. January, 1897. To memory. I have known thee when thy mood is black, when wild regret had clutched thee as a prey, and I have marked thee shudder looking back. Oh, sometimes he would swing himself up to a tree branch and gaze down with his face of loving interest on the little children with their readings. And he would say, They are like fairies. A neighbor once said of him, It makes me happy just to see him about as he hunts with his dog in the fields. He looks so holy and sweet and bright. He would seem more child of the skies than of earth as he used to lie for hours on the grass with his face upturned to heaven and radiant with the thoughts within from which came such rich fruit. Oh, and almost his last word to me was to ask me if I were warm enough and to beg me to draw the cover over my shoulders when I lay down upon my cot in his room. Oh, Stevie... Stevie, you have long been a heavenly child. Do you like it, dear? Do you like it? I spend many lonely hours, and if it were not for the baby and the kittens and the garden, I don't know what would become of me. With these blessings and a few good books, the world may be forgotten. The Night Watch A shrouded woman sits through the dark night upon the old roots of an oak, alone. She hears the wind. She sees no point of light. She rocks herself and cries and maketh moan. The night grows wilder and the owl is out. The field mice tremble to his shivering cry. The mad wind beats the homeless leaves about. The thin shapes of evil souls are hurtled by. O oh, little form that I may never fold beyond my empty arms, my baby stands. Wings Shall we know in the hereafter all the reasons that are hid? Does the butterfly remember what the caterpillar did? How he waited, toiled, and suffered to become the chrysalid? When we creep so slowly upward, when each day new burden brings, when we strive so hard to conquer vexing sublunary things, when we wait and toil and suffer, we are working for our wings. Many winter days are dark and stormy. It rains or it snows or the wind howls and the outer prospect is comfortless. Being obliged to spend a winter in the country for the sake of the health of the children, I determined to have a room in which they would be able to play without disturbing the elders and where they could always feel at liberty to invite their little friends. It was to be preeminently the children's room, but it proved so decidedly the pleasantest room in the house that the grown-ups were found there as often as the little ones. 
I will describe the furnishings of this simple room that you may see how little is required to make such a snuggery. The old Baghdad couch, cover in its five stripes, a dingy old battered mahogany desk, and a stained lopsided center table. Every member of the family contributed some treasure. Last of all, the flower table was brought and put in the southwest window, and some fern and palms and a few begonias set in the opposite window. So the playroom has become the plant room as well, and is the most comfortable room in the house.